going to play Jonathan Little versus Jonathan Little. We're going to be going through some hands on PokerCoaching.com. And we're going to see how I played about three years ago. And I'm going to tell you how I would play these spots today. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We are here today with our special guest. What's your name? Kevin. Why did you not go to school today? Why did you not go to school today? Because I don't know. Because you have a cough and Daddy has a cough too. We're all sick. So this will be great because Jonathan Little on the screen will do most of the talking. Do you like being on the show? This is Thomas. He's a mushy, mushy boy. He's a mushy, mushy boy. We are going to get to some hands. Why don't you tell everybody bye-bye? Bye, Dad. Can you say good luck in your games? Good luck in your games. All right. See you later. Again. You want to do it again? You can do it again later. Come in, Come back in like an hour. Okay. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, sweet boy. Today we have a long day of recording content for PokerCoaching.com and for YouTube. And I'm sick. So, you want to know what I, I do when I'm sick? I'll give you the, the tip. There's this stuff called traditional medicinals. <laughs> Throat coat tea. I drink this stuff whenever I record audiobooks. And I can then record audiobooks like all day. Despite being sick, despite whatever. You can just grind it out. You don't have to cough or anything. It's amazing. Throat coat tea by traditional medicinals or whatever, whatever I said. All right, let's go through some Jonathan Little hands. Let me know if the volume's too loud, too soft, whatever. Here we have pocket jacks and a $5,000 buy-in tournament folds to me in the hijack seat, playing pretty deep. Should we fold, call, raise to 400, or raise to 600? Feel free to type in your answer as we go. This is a spot where some people may raise to 400, but I'm gonna to raise to 600 basically every time playing 175 big blinds deep. This hand is great, you wanna build a pot, and I, uh, you know, you build the pot by making the pot a little bit big. So let's raise it up. I'm probably starting to sound like a broken record here, but 600, three big blinds is my standard raise in most scenarios playing very deep stack because we don't mind building the pot, and we're more likely to win the pot than our opponents. So we do raise to 600. Kitty Quo calls on the button. Generally, you know, tight, tight aggressive type player. Probably not too out of line. Small blind calls. Flop comes. 10, 4, 4. And now, splashy. Overvalue player. If you remember the previous quiz of mine, the guy who had the 9, 6, leads the flop. All right. Should we fold, call, raise to 3,000, or raise to 4,500? Ooh, interesting spot, interesting spot. This is where you have to ask, how absurd is this player? They play, apparently played the 9-6 offsuit earlier. Um, look, if we raise, you have to ask, will this player just call every time with a 10 and put a lot of money in? If the answer to that is yes, then I love putting in a raise. Probably something like 3,700, which is not an option here. Um, the problem is, is this player could just have a four, right? If they are actually that loose, that splashy, that absurd... Obviously, they're way more likely to have a 10, but the problem is if they have a 10, they may or may not pay us off, especially if the turn or a river brings a bad card. Another problem with calling is it lets Kitty Quo call stuff like King, Queen of Diamonds and try to spike, right? And that's not great. Um, I'm, I'm still just going to call, though. I think it's a pretty reasonable spot to call. Coco Yo, you, says, your new player just joined. For, you've been here for two weeks. Awesome. Hope you're having a good time. Glad that you're here. If you're glad to be here, if you enjoy the show, click the like and subscribe button. I would appreciate it. I think we're just going to call, though. This is a kind of weird spot because no... One second. Kyler here says something. Call, especially with one player left to act. It's actually more of a reason to raise. When you're against multiple players yet to act, you want to raise to force them off whatever bits of equity that they have, Right? So in this spot, if Kitty has a hand like pocket two, she's just going to fold to any bet and call. But if she has a hand like king, queen of diamonds or ace, jack of diamonds or something like that, she could very, very easily call. And that's not really good for me. So this is a spot where we definitely want to get the cutoff to fold and we want to extract full value from the small blind. So normally, in a normal scenario, I think calling is by far the default play. But 
in this exact spot, I think raising at least has some merit. And, uh, you know, you should always consider that. Um, okay, let's see what I say. No one should really have many fours in their range. I mean, we all have ace-four suited and perhaps five-four suited, but that's it, right? Um, we can't really expect the small blind to have random you know, nine-four suited, like perhaps they'd have if they were in the big blind, but, eh, you know, who knows? <laughs> Opponent is flashing. This is a spot where when they lead kind of big for two-thirds pot, I'm usually just going to call with the majority of my continuing range here because they're essentially saying by leading that they have a very polarized range. And if they have a very polarized range, I in turn don't get to raise very often. So this is a spot where I think calling is the only viable play. Not going to fold, clearly. Um, if we knew we could raise here and have this player just play for a ton of money with a 10, then that would be great. The problem, though, is that if I raise, they may not play for very much money with a 10, but they'll always play for all the money with a 4, right? Also, um, you know, Kitty could be behind me with a four, ace four suited, five four suited, like I said. Not that it's likely, but it could happen. And if I call and she raises and then Splashy Player decides to put all their money in, then we can sidestep this kind of dicey spot. So we're just going to call. Yep, I like call. Um, if we raise and get re-raised by the Splashy Player, what do we do? Well, I don't know. That's the reason you don't want to raise, right? This is where you have to have a really, really good read. What hand would you raise? No hands. Pretty much no hands. I mean, maybe, I mean, because think about it. If I have a four, right, they're just drawing dead. If I have aces, I don't want to raise. I think jacks is a reasonable raising hand because it's pretty vulnerable. Maybe a hand like um, ace 10 is a, reason, a reasonable raising hand because it's very vulnerable. But I really just don't have much of a raising range in this spot at all. Kitty calls weird. Kitty calls too. Probably not ideal. Um, when she calls, I think she's going to have a lot of just like 10x or good strong over cards like king, queen of hearts that, that has good equity. Turn is the three of clubs, and now Splashy Player checks. Hmm. Hmm. Should we check, bet 2,000, bet 4,000, or bet 6,000? Oh, nasty spot, nasty spot. What do you think? What do you think? I think in this spot, you want to bet question is how much do you want to bet? It's either two or four, right? Um, if you're pretty sure one of the two opponents has a 10, which is kind of likely, I mean, that's the hand that Kitty's most likely to have. Although, like I said, she'd have king, queen suited, ace, two suited, stuff like that with backdoor draws. Um, if she's pretty likely to have a 10, she's probably not going to fold to a bet. So I think we want to go something like 4,000. In the ideal world, maybe more like 3,000 is better. Of these options, I suppose 4,000 is the best play, but I think 3,000 is very nice too. And the splashy player who also overvalues, meaning they're just not going to fold, uh, this is the type of player that will just call down with a 10, right? So I think I like going 4,000 exploitatively. GTO play is probably about a little bit smaller though. If the board was more coordinated, would you bet more often? Yeah, but I mean, I'm going to bet this turn basically every time. The question is just which size do we use? So now we have the best hand most of the time because, like I said, Kitty probably has a whole lot of 10x or over cards. And the splashy player, you have to presume, would just keep betting with most of their fours. So that means they probably have a whole lot of 10s as well or just, like, nonsense bluffs, like, I don't even know, 9-8 of hearts, stuff like that. So I think we want to bet, but we want to bet pretty small because I think both players are in pretty marginal shape. Now, if we knew somehow that one of the two players had a 10 then I would definitely like going a little bit bigger, like 4,000. But I don't really like going big, like 6,000, because then I think we actually will start getting our opponents to make pretty big folds, because this is a spot where I could very, very easily just have aces, right? So the opponents have to be a little bit cautious if I'm all of a sudden wanting to put all my money in the pot. So I think this is a scenario where I want to typically bet small, but I could, I could, get a, I could see 4,000 being fine too. I don't think we want to check here. Because I do think both people, uh, both opponents are going to have pretty good equity or a hand that would call a bet, right? Like, I really don't want to let ace, ten, and king, queen see a free river. That would be a disaster. So we do go for a bet. We bet 2,000. So like I said there, I do think 2,000 is the default. But exploitatively, given these exact reads, I definitely think that this is a spot where we probably want to go just a little bit bigger. If someone limps, you raise to four big blinds. Somebody re-raises to 20 big blinds. What do you do with queen-jack offsuit? Fold! As Coco Yo Yu says, post hand questions in the Poker Coaching Discord. That is right. Go to pokercoaching.com, click on the community tab. That'll take you right to our Discord. We have a lot of excellent poker players there discussing hands, improving their skills, 
and that is a great place to discuss all sorts of poker strategy on a regular basis. So check that out. That's an easy one, though. Somebody limps and you raise the four of blinds, and somebody re raises to 20, you fold when you have nothing, and Queen Jack is nothing. Kitty folds, splashy player calls. Kind of a weird fold by Kitty. I gotta presume she had a hand like pocket nines, pocket eights, maybe um, king, queen of diamonds, stuff like that. Nine, good. River's an ace. If the opponent checks, we're just gonna check it here. They could easily have random ace high, and they may not even call a bet with a 10 anymore. That is. Probably true, but maybe not. This is, again, another scenario where it's very important to consider your opponent's tendencies, right? This is a spot where if your opponent will just call with a 10 for, like, a small bet of, like, 3K, put in 3K and get full value. But they surprise me, and they lead half pot. Mm. Should we fold, call, raise to 12,000, or go all in? Well... We, we, we get led into for half pot. This is a spot where a lot of people say, well, the ace comes, I guess I have to fold. But no, 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 no. In this scenario, you have to ask, am I good 25% of the time? You probably are, right? I mean, it's an unfortunate spot. There are certainly some players who will just show up with an ace literally every time. But uh, as Bamanic says here in the chat, pot odds, gotta call, period, yeah. Simple as that. Are we good 25% of the time against somebody who's splashy and or overvalues their hand? I think definitely yes. Easy call. Sometimes we're going to lose a lot. So it's either a call or a fold. I have to presume with this hand. I was sitting here thinking, if I did have a nut hand, like aces or tens, I would definitely want to raise, right? What bluffs do I have in this spot, though? There's really not many. <laughs> um, am I supposed to bluff here with like rand a random 10 in my hand? Like 10-7? Probably not. To block the full house? I, I cannot imagine I would ever want to raise with an ace. The three doesn't really matter. So get, I think I'm supposed to raise here with like a random 10 in my hand, as weird as that sounds. Let's think, um, about, it. Let's think about it. So look, this is what you want to be thinking about in spots like this. What a lot of people get in the habit of doing is thinking, what do I do with my pocket jacks? But in reality, you always want to ask, how would I like to play every hand in my range? And like I said here, when I go on this random tangent, and some of people will view as a tangent, some people think it's just a normal thought process, you want to ask, what do I want to raise with? Because whenever you have a bluff catcher, like I have here, all bluff catchers are conceivably bluffing candidates. So you want to ask, which hands really want to bluff? So think about the hands I'd raise preflop, call a flop bet, bet the turn, <laughs> and then get to the river in the spot with that are bluff catchers and or bad. That would be stuff like king, king queen of clubs, king jack of clubs, queen jack of clubs, those are all reasonable bluffing hands. Um, jack nine of clubs, right? Maybe that's a hand we would float the flop with. But that's about it, if you think about it, right? Maybe queen nine of clubs, king nine of clubs. It's only like five, five, six, seven combinations of hands, something like that. So if that's the case, well, do we want to have any raising range? Obviously, if we have ace four suited, we're going to raise, right? So there's one of those. If we have aces or tens or fours or threes, we're going to raise. There's one, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's ten of those. So it's eleven nut hands, right? We have eleven nut combinations. We can probably get away with having, I don't know, four, five, six bluffs, something like that. Six bluffs. So if we use every club hand, I think that's probably fine. The question is, will we even want to do that? Probably not. Um, so then another thing you want to consider when bluffing is not just like what are the worst hands I have, but also which hands block his auto calls. Which hands is this guy going to lead and then automatically call a raise with every time? Well, a four, but a four is the nuts, so that doesn't really matter. The next thing would be a full house or top two pair. So which cards block top two pair full houses? And that would be a 10, right? I think a 10 is actually a pretty good hand. Like I said here, something like 10-7 suited or 10-8 suited may be a pretty good one. Maybe something like jack 10 would want to bluff or queen, queen 10 would want to bluff because those block ace 10, or uh, those, yeah, those block ace 10 and, and like ace queen, right? So maybe those are hands you want to consider bluffing. Neat spot, though, right? Where, from a GTO point of view, you certainly want to at least consider having bluffs. The question is, should we even have bluffs in this spot? There are a lot of spots in poker where I just don't bluff. If I think the opponent's going to call a lot. But, I mean, if this guy is actually splashy, will he call a raise with an ace? I don't know. Anyway, I think this is just an easy call. <laughs> that said, in this scenario, I think it's either a call or a fold. Um, so, should we call or should we fold? And this is, again, a very, very player-dependent spot. And you're going to find that a lot of scenarios you are playing against players who you think are well out of line, either by 
them being way too tight and passive or way too loose and splashy and aggressive. Your play is going to depend highly on how you should just play against someone whose range has either far too many value hands or far too many bluffs. I think this player's range probably has far too many bluffs. Therefore, I'm going to call. However, I definitely think, in general, this is a fold. And I think it's a close spot either way. The problem here is that even if this opponent is splashy slash overvalues, they could definitely be betting here with an ace. Like, say they did have ace X of clubs. I could easily see this player just betting 5,000 because they think they have the best hand, which is a big bummer, right? Um, we always want to consider, like, if the opponent's range is wider than it should be, is it wider than it should be with additional bluffs in it? Or is it wider than it should be with additional value hands in it? It's important concept. And I really have no clue. That said, you all know me. I'm a bit of a calling station. Um, I, I probably call here the majority of the time, but I could certainly be convinced that this is not a good play. And I'm actually going to give call the second best answer here. I think folding is probably just right because I think most people you run into in this spot are just going to show up with a random ace X or um, like a, a weird four. But um, yeah, it's probably just a fold. It's an annoying spot, but I think it's probably a fold. <laughs> that said, I call. <laughs> like, I, I, you know me, right? Pot odds. Pot odds exist. You give me pot odds, I call. And the opponent has 10-8, which is a hand I don't really expect to see here all that often, which you know, kind of also makes me think that folding would be better. However, when they show up with this hand, it's like, oh, well, clearly I should be calling if they're going to be leading with random 10s, which makes no sense whatsoever. So it's one of these spots where people look at this hand and think, oh, easy call. Why didn't you give call 10 points? Because, I mean, really analyzing the spot away from the table, slightly removed from it, I, I think folding is probably right. And I think the opponent made a completely ridiculous play that most people do not make. And people look at this spot and they think, okay, it's an easy call. And it reinforces call in their heads over and over and over again. And, well, not even over and over again, but a few times. And that's enough to make some people call on the spot every time. And I think if you call on the spot against the average player or even slightly splashy aggressive players, it's going to be a losing play in general. So I, I like folding in this spot, even though I did call this time. And I can tell you that if I'm playing this hand t tomorrow in this exact same spot, I probably would have still found the call because I probably had some read that this opponent was just way over bluffing or I could look and tell they were bluffing in this particular spot. So live reads exist. And uh, the tough thing about these quizzes is kind of hard to really know what live reads we have going on. So I realize this is a tough quiz. I'm sure some of you said call in this scenario on the river and um, we would have won the hand, but I still don't think it's right. Sorry. <laughs> So this is one of these spots where, like I said, live reads are very, 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 very relevant. If you have good live reads, then opponent's bluffing, you think they're just drastically overvaluing nonsense, like this player, I don't know what he was doing with this 10-8. If you have reads like that, then I think that this is a spot where it's really, really, really easy to call. But think about, think about, find the bluffs, right? Notice that our hand blocks a whole lot of the logical bluffs, like king, jack, and clubs, queen, jack, and clubs, etc. right? And this is not a good calling hand, unless they're going to be making ridiculous plays with 10-8, but this player was. Uh, why isn't his lift moving? They're watching a video of myself. This is Jonathan Little versus Jonathan Little. Click that like button. Yeah, click that like button. I would appreciate it. Can I explain my thought process with the ace two? Poker Masters, heads up. Yeah, 20 big blinds deep. The opponent uh, limped 20 big blinds deep, playing heads up with an ante. I consulted my GTO preflop charts before I played heads up because uh, you want to make sure you're playing good, head, good heads up strategy against world-class opponents. I was against a good, strong world-class opponent. And uh, it's an easy all-in. So that's why I went all-in. It was an easy all-in. I'm organizing a deck of cards here to get ready for a deck of degeneracy drawing in a little bit. And I'm missing the ace of hearts. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Where did it go? Bad beat. Anyway, I consulted the GTO charts and I did what the GTO chart says. Against good opponents, do what the GTO chart says. He had pocket eights, which he should be limping like he did and then calling a shove. Sometimes he lose. All right, let's take a look at another hand from this $5,000 tournament. Here we have King Jack suited on the button facing a limp from a splashy player who probably overvalues hands. So this is probably someone who's playing a decent amount of hands, doing a lot of limping, and then not a whole lot of folding post-flop. Should we fold, call, raise to 2,500, or raise to 4,000? What do you think? Is the volume cutting in and out for other people? It seems like we have... No drop frames. It's probably just on for you. Watching the YouTube video. Currently around 5,000 pounds of profit. Good job. Good work. Definitely a spot to raise. You say no, you have the ace of hearts. Don't worry. We're going to find another deck. 
throw this deck in the garbage. Goodbye. Um, I'm just going to make a five big blind raise here the vast majority of the time. I mean, this, this hand is pretty much always good, especially against this loose, splashy, battley player. I don't think we want to go to 44,000. I think that's going to start to get folds from nonsense, which, which we really want to keep in the pot. Um, some of you are saying to three bet. You cannot three bet. A three bet is when someone raises before you. Here there is no raise, therefore we're making a two bet. Let's discuss this ridiculous terminology the poker player somehow adopted. The initial big blind is the first bet, okay? When this player limps, they are calling the first bet. Therefore, an initial preflop raise or a raise after a limp is called a two bet. Stupid, I know. If somebody raises and then it folds to you and you want to re-raise, that would be a three bet, okay? So this is just a two bet. A lot of people screw this up post-flop as well. They think a raise over a flop bet is a three bet, but no, it's a two bet because there is no bet. The first bet is the one bet. Dumb terminology comes from Limit Hold'em. Limit Hold'em is an old antiquated game that I do not recommend you spend much effort on. All right. For the most part, in spots like this, you're just going to want to raise to 2,500 just purely to extract value from under the gun's loose, splashy range. Um, the only time you would not raise here is if you thought for some reason under the gun was a tricky limper because you don't especially want to raise to 2,500 and then get limp re-raised to 8,000 even if you know your opponent is kind of active. You'd rather just call and see a cheap flop. Um, or if you can look and tell one of the players in the blinds clearly likes their hand. If that's the case, then we can limp. One of the blinds will raise to say 3,000 or so and then we'll get to call and see a flop in position which is also fine. So this is a spot where I'm going to raise the vast majority of the time, but, you know, calling's fine too. And I do elect to call eh. this time. Kitty Quo in the small blind elects to raise. I'm basically only going to call here if I expect this guy to re-raise me, but given the read, this guy's kind of a nut. I think that we should probably just put in the raise. I think that seems uh, very, 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 very reasonable. 2,500. She's generally on the more tight, aggressive side. I expect her to have a pretty strong range here. The initial limper calls, as expected, and now it's back to me. Should we fold, call, re-raise to 7,000, or re-raise to 10,000? What do you think? We limp, get raised. Should we three bet? <laughs> Should we three bet, call, fold, etc., 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 etc.? I have a deck of cards here made by Pop Wonder. Isn't this nice what it says? These cards were designed by a working musician who lost every gig during COVID-19 pandemic during 2020. By making this purchase, you've enabled them to live a creative life for one more day. Thank you. It's pretty cool. Pretty nice, right? It's good to support people. Somehow, though, these cards are a little bit wonky. When I say wonky, I mean, uh, you know, like, heart's a little bit funny. Diamond. Eh, a little bit funny. Maybe I should use these. I don't know. If you're here, do you think I should use Pop Wonder cards or regular cards? I'm going to use regular cards. I'm going to, I, I don't want to draw on the blue joker is what it amounts to. Uh, this is definitely a spot to call. Easy call. Call, see the flop. Calling is the only play that has any viability right here. We're not going to fold. The hand's great. And we're getting good odds in position, closing the action. So we know folding's out of the question. And we're not going to re-raise because am I ever limping behind the initial limper with any sort of premium range here? And the answer is just never, right? So even though we do have a pretty good hand, this is not a hand I'd want to re-raise because if I re-raise to any amount, 7,000 or 10,000, Kitty can then just rip it all in and I'm going to have to fold. And I do expect her to have a pretty good hand. Now she could have a you know non-premium hand, like let's say Jack-10 suited or Ace-9 offsuit or something like that. Um, but at the same time, that's still like not a garbage hand. She's definitely going to have all the best hands too. So this is a spot where we're just going to call and see the flop every time. I do think Kitty's range is going to be very, 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 very strong and linear. So I don't expect her to have too much nonsense. Flop comes. 10, 7, 6. Two spades. Kitty checks. Splashy player checks. Ooh, do we go for it here? Ooh. Should we check? Bet 2,500. Bet 5,000. Or bet 7,500. Mm, 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 mm. What do you think? I mean, I don't mind bluffing. <laughs> this is not a great bluffing hand. I'd rather have spades or clubs. Um, that said, if you think that Kitty's checking range is that overly weak with mostly over pair or over cards and under pairs, mostly over cards, then I think betting's pretty nice. Because you gotta think the splashy player is gonna bet very frequently. I mean, we just saw this player bet um 
top pair, no kicker, lead into me, right? So if your opponent's going to be betting slash leading with a lot of their value range, then it becomes pretty reasonable to put in a bluff whenever they check because their checking range should be quite weak, right? So if their checking range is quite weak, I think it's actually a pretty good spot to go for a bet. Um, I think we can go any size. Probably smaller is better, just with most of the range. We'll get called a lot and then triple it off. Maybe. Checking's obviously fine. I want to make it clear. Checking's obviously fine. I'd probably just check this, but whatever. Maybe I bet. I don't know what I did. So this is a spot where I think it's a pretty easy check behind. Uh, we have really not a lot of equity at all here, and it's pretty easy for one of our opponents to have a marginal made hand that will call at least one bet. Um, that said, if you can kind of look and tell both your opponents are generally on the weaker side, then I don't mind betting. You got to think this board's going to connect pretty well with the under the gun splashy range though. So I'm just going to check here the vast majority of the time. And uh, this time I do not. I go for the 5,000 bet, which I think if you're going to make a bet, you do want to go on the bigger side, either 5,000 or 7,500. Eh, okay, because they're trying to get our opponents off. Back then, when I recorded this hand, there were not good post-flop multi-way solvers. Um, nowadays, I think people know pretty definitively that the GTO play is to bet on the smaller side with a lot of your range in the spot because whenever you do bet, you should just have your opponent smashed, right? So if you have your opponent smashed, you usually just want to go small because you don't really care if they call. Um, I don't hate it, you know? If I can look and tell they're both weak, it's free free pot most of the time. Most of the time. Does Kitty ever trap in the spot? I don't know. It depends on if she's good or not, and I do think she is good. So uh, that should certainly make you a little bit more cautious when it comes to betting. If you know Kitty's range, though, contains, like, all unpaired hands or hands worse than a 10, and you know this player's range does not contain a 10, then I think betting's, like, really, 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 really good. Can you consistently get a read, like, they aren't in love with their hand while playing? I mean, not necessarily. Not against good players. But, um, you know, live, re live reads are a thing. If you can tell they're done with it, or if you think that you know something about their strategy and you're right, I mean, this is just a, a really good bet. If you're unsure, this bet starts to get a lot worse. Off of a lot of their marginal hands. Look, I, I realize this is loose, this is aggressive, this is splashy, this is not my default play. And uh, so far in this quiz, we've had two non-standard plays, right? But, you know, sometimes that happens. You're not going to feel like the right play when you're in game in spots like this is the standard play all of the time. Um, so in this scenario, we would have played this hand quite differently most of the time. But here we are. We've got 5,000. Kitty calls. Mm, not good. For Splashy me. player folds. Turn is the queen of hearts and Kitty checks. Should we check? Bet 5,000. Bet 10,000. Or bet 15,000. Oh boy. Oh boy. So what does our check, rate, check calling range look like? I think it's going to be a lot of hands containing a 10, a lot of hands containing pocket nines, pocket eights, or a lot of pocket nines, pocket eights, a lot of flush draws. They did not want to bet and get raised. Um, maybe stuff like ace seven suited, ace six suited, probably not. Maybe just like ace king that check called. Be a pretty splashy check call with ace king, I think. So we have uh, another exploit spot here where I think... You don't really want to bet this hand because you will get jammed sometimes. And you really, really, really don't want to get jammed off of this hand. That would be awful. It would be awful to get check jammed off this hand, right? So I think we probably want to check it back if we think Kitty's ever checked shoving. If we think she just has, again, mostly marginal made hands, I like a bet of something like 7K and then jam river. Notice if we bet 7 and she calls. Probably go up to, what, 30K, give or take, 32K. She'll have 23 left. I think that's pretty nice. I think, that, I think that's pretty nice. Um, I mean, look. The bet size option I gave are not great here. I think I'd probably rather go more like 7K. 5K is probably okay too, though. 5K, no, you're going to get called a lot in the Jam River. I think that's also pretty reasonable. So now we're in an interesting spot where when she check calls our flop bet, she could easily have aces. I think that is definitely possible. She could easily have over pairs. She could also have ace king, though. And maybe even um, ace queen or ace jack. I, I recognize we block ace, king, and ace track. She could also have an under pair, like maybe pocket eights. Maybe a hand like ace seven suited, ace six suited. I think all of those are at least reasonable for her to have at this point to check call. Uh, she could, of course, have a 10. She could have ace 10, king 10, queen 10, jack 10. Uh, and you may say, would she actually check out of position in this scenario with a decently strong hand like an over pair or a 10? And I think she would. I mean, she plays good, solid poker. She knows out of position, multi way. You got to be kind of cautious. So this is a spot where 
We want to be careful in general, but we also do want to bet with some bluffs. Um, in terms of which bluffs to bet with, I think if we happen to have a random like ace eight or ace nine suited, we would definitely want to bet those. Um, bad spades, if we had it, we probably want to bet. We don't really have bad spades. Um, so this is a spot where I, it's kind of hard to come up with too many bluffs, right? So given it's kind of hard to come up with too many bluffs, and we definitely have some hands we'd want to value bet, like sets and two pairs and straights, I, I think we want to use the vast majority of our bluffs here. And what we want to do in this spot is use a bet size that will give us the most amount of fold equity on the turn and river combined. And we have a few options. We can either bet small now and then big on the river, or we can bet medium now and medium on the river, or you can bet big now and then small on the river. We could also just rip it all in, but I don't think that's a particularly great play because she's going to call, call very well against that with like any 10 or better. She's not going to look at this queen and think, oh no, a 10's no good anymore, or pocket nines are no good anymore. She's probably just going to find calls in that spot a lot of the time. So I don't love overbetting. I think in this spot, we want to go for a small bet, either 5,000 or 10,000, because that's going to give us some fold equity on the river. Uh, what you don't want to do here is you don't want to bet like 15,000, half of her stack, because then on the river, you're going to have a difficult time having any fold equity. So this is a spot where I think either 5,000 or 10,000 is the right play. And I think given we don't have all that many bluffs in this spot, I don't think we want to use... A lot of our bluffs in this scenario, and, and I think King Jack's probably fine enough. If I had a hand like Jack Nine, I would definitely bluff that instead, or even like Jack Eight, I'd be bluffing that too. I'm definitely betting all of my bad bluffs. I want to make that really clear here. Like my low equity bluffs, I'm way more happy betting because sometimes when we do bet here, we are going to get check shoved, and you don't want to get check raised here. Like betting five thousand or ten thousand, getting check raised here is a disaster. Um, but I don't think it's going to happen all that often, and I don't really have all that many logical bluffs, so I like a bet. We do go five thousand. I think all. I think everything calls, I said as expected. Is, uh, when you go small on the turn, sense, you don't. Right, that's the spot where you don't want to get check raised. If you think her range is kind of capped, then I think it's fine. Anyway, so I, I like this, but I, I probably would have bet it just like a touch bigger because I think we have basically no fold equity for five. I'd rather bet more like seven to have some fold equity now, and that'll probably give us roughly the same amount of fold equity on the river. Don't really have much fold equity on the turn, but maybe you have it on the river. She checks river. Should we check? Bet ten thousand, or go all in? obviously all in. I think this is a pretty easy all in. The only way we possibly have to get her off of pocket nines, pocket eights, maybe tens is to go all in. I'm not sure if she's actually going to fold all that many tens. Uh, she could also have ace king. And this is actually a, a closer spot than you may think, because you have to ask, what are you trying to get your opponent off of? If you're trying to get her to fold ace king or ace jack then we don't need to bet big we can just bet small right however i do think some of her range is going to be pairs like nines eights ace seven suited ace six suited jack ten ten nine suited so given i think she does have a lot of those types hand type of hands and i think the only way to get those hands to fold is to shove i think going all in is the right play here now if you think she's just always going to call you with like pocket eights pocket nines and a ten for an all-in, then that bet size becomes terrible, and you instead want to probably bet small, assuming you think she even has ace, king, race, jack in her range. This is this is a tough spot, but again, if you think about the hands in my range, I don't have all that many bluffs. So whenever you don't have all that many bluffs, you have to look a little bit hard to find them. And like I said, on the turn, we certainly have lots of hands that would love to bet. Like any any two-pair and better hand, we're just thrilled piling our money in. If I had like ace, queen, or king, queen, I would definitely go for the bet as well. So this is a spot where I'm probably going to go for the shove. Pally Time says, 10K is a small bet here, LOL. Well, pot's 28,000, right? A third pot bet is small. Then you say, oh, those are big blinds, not money, LOL. You got to realize that all that matters is how many big blinds you're playing. It doesn't matter if it's cash. It doesn't matter if it is chips. It doesn't matter if it's uh, Beanie Babies you're playing for or Pogs or Pokemon cards. What matters is how many big blinds are in the pot, 57. 20 big blinds is a small bet into a 57 big line pot. She does shove. I'm sorry, I shove. She calls. Yeah. Ace 10. Got and it. I lose. And I think this is a fine call by her. It's actually kind of a tough spot given she has ace of spades because she blocks the flush draw that I could easily have, but I still think it's a call. Definitely a call for her. It can't be going around folding to 10. This is a spot that where a lot of weaker players would find a fold and that would be really bad. And you would have exploited them hard, but you're not trying to get her off of a hand like ace 10. You're trying to get her off a hand like jack 10 suited or something like that. Would you thin value bet a 10 on the river? No, I think we're going to go with a queen or better. Because she, you have to realize she could easily have aces or kings, right? So you have to be a little bit cautious there. 
You may say, you bluffed and you lost. Bad play. Uh, no, we played it perfectly. <laughs> Again, uh, the flop was the only spot that's questionable. I don't think you have to bet the flop. If we did not bet the flop, we would have bet the turn and jam the river or bet big on the river. Sometimes you just run into it. And we have a pretty reasonable bluff spot. You got to go for it. Here we have queen, jack, offsuit. Fresh off, bluffing off a lot of chips. We are in the hijack seat. Should we fold? Call. This is a situation where I'm going to be raising the queen jack most of the time from the hijack seat. From the earlier positions, like low jack under the gun plus one, I don't hate a fold. If you told me you wanted to fold, I'd say sure. But from the hijack seat, I'm pretty much always raising the queen jack offsuit. And Natty got it wrong. Minimum raise is ideal, maybe a touch bigger than minimum. You don't want to start going two and a half, or three big blinds or four big blinds because then you're opening yourself to getting shoved on. Whenever you start to get down to like 30 big blinds, you want to use a min raise. If you had the king jack in that previous hand and you decided to check back the turn, I did not check back the turn, I bet. But if I did check back the turn, would you have to bluff the river? I mean, if you're sitting on the river with the random king high, yeah, probably. I think a min raise is the best play in this scenario as we start getting kind of shallow. I go 2.4 big blinds or so, which I also think is fine. I don't have a problem with this. But um, I think you probably just want to go a little bit smaller as you start to get down to 30 big blinds or so. But it's not that big of a deal. Kid on the button calls, recreational player in the big blind calls. We see a flop of Ooh. king, 10, 9. We have the nuts. Recreational player in the big blind leads. It's not really expected. If they check the flop, by the way, we would definitely bet. Anyway, they lead. Should we fold? Actually, we're not folding. Should we call? Raise to 4,500. Raise to 7,500. Or go all in. Definitely a weird spot because the opponent should effectively never, ever, ever lead in this spot because I have all the nuts and they have a whole lot of garbage. But the opponent is leading, which implies that they are probably very bad. So fine, they're very bad. Now, the question becomes, if I raise, will they just put all their money in with a king? Will they put all their money in with uh, queen 10? Who knows? The problem with calling here is that the pot is already... Well, look at the pot. 6,900, they're betting 2,200, right? They're giving themselves really good odds if they happen to have a draw, right? And the issue is that if your opponent does have a draw, or if the player on the button has a draw, which they very often will, you're actually giving them pretty good odds to draw. Now, I realize there aren't a ton of draws available, right? But they could easily have two pair. They could easily have a set, right? And you'd much rather get all the money in before either a scary card comes and makes them not pay you, or they, they get there, right? So I think we probably want to raise. And I, I like a 4,500 raise in this spot, I think. The problem is they bet so small, right? If they bet bigger, like 5K, I would definitely call. But when they bet tiny, I think raising becomes reasonable. I mean, if you look at GTO strategies, raising becomes very reasonable as your opponents bet smaller and smaller and smaller. Like if they bet one big blind here, you're going to call a one big blind bet? It's almost as if they checked, right? And you got to realize they only bet 2.75 big blinds. It's not like it's a big bet or anything. So... I think we probably want to put in a small raise. I'm really not bluffing here ever. That's probably a problem against a good player, but we're against a recreational player, which is good. If there was no flush draw, I'd definitely call. The problem is it's like really easy for this player to have some sort of a flush draw, and it's really easy for this player to have a hand with pretty good equity. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to put in a small raise. Some people look at this spot and think that Ooh, we want it. to raise because we really <laughs> don't want to get outdrawn by the Let's various draws this. available. And this comes from studying a lot. I know that whenever you're facing a tiny bet, you need to raise some, period. You need to. You need to raise some against small bets. Now, you'd probably rather raise with two pair, right? Or ace king, because those hands are almost always good as well. And the thing is, like, if the opponent does have some total garbage, like ace 10, I really want to keep him in, right? So maybe this hand is just too good to raise. Facing that tiny bet, though, I don't mind putting in a small raise. And against a recreational player, for 45, for 20, 2,300 more, I don't see them folding much of anything. I mean, it'd be an exploitative raise against this player, for sure. But also against small bets, I, I think raising is at least somewhat viable. And I certainly do agree that the recreational player could easily have two pair or flush draw in the scenario. However, recreational player can also just have some total nonsense, like ace jack that's drawing very thin, or... A king, like king three suited that decides to lead for no good reason. And for that reason, I think we just want to call. The only time you'd really want to raise here is if you are very sure that 
the big blind has a hand like a king and will not fold it to a raise, but will be really cautious if you call and you get perhaps a non-ideal turn. Like some people here, they'll lead a hand like king three, and if you raise, they'll just rip their stack in, which you know is clearly a bad play, but it's what some people do. Whereas if you call and the turn's any diamond, queen, jack, medium card, really anything, they'll check and then check call or check and even check fold. So if your opponent's especially insane on the flop, then I definitely think it is viable to raise. If you are going to raise, you want to go to about three times the opponent's bet um, when they use a regular bet size. But when the opponent goes so small here, you can usually go a little bit bigger. You can size it up to like 7,500. But I'm basically never raising here because I really, really, really want to keep this player in the pot. And um, also, if I call the player on the button, they also have a good hand. So I say I really, really, really want to keep him in the pot. But I mean, now, I guess exploitatively, I, I like just putting in a raise and keeping him in with everything for 2,300 more. I don't see anybody folding loose flashy recreational player for 2300 more like say the player on the button has i don't know king queen or 10 9 if it goes bet raise like king queen and 10 9 should both probably just find a tight fold whereas if it goes bet call now king queen and 10 9 are really really happy that's true so i like slow playing here typically when you have a hand that is really really strong and not all that susceptible to being outdrawn you typically want to call i realize we are kind of susceptible to, susceptible to being outdrawn here but eh, not really probably not as much as some people may think um like I said, I'd be way more inclined to raise two pair for that reason, right? Or ace king or aces, because it's almost always the best hand, but really vulnerable, whereas queen jack is less vulnerable. So, I mean, I get the idea of slow playing. Turn is the king. Now we lose to the full houses. Look what we did. Uh, big blind checks. Should we check? Bet 3,500, bet 7,000, or bet 10,500? I mean, we want to be able to get all in by the river, no problem. I think, though, the right play is to probably just go tiny against this player, although the problem with tiny is that you're giving draws really good odds. Luke says check. No, 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 definitely don't want to check. You definitely want to bet to get money in the pot. If the opponent has a king, they're never folding. If they have a 10, they're never folding. If they have a 9, they may not fold if they have a queen or a jack with it. So we definitely want to bet. I hate the big bet size. Notice we only have 20,000 chips, right? You definitely don't want to bet just like half your stack here because then it... Scream strength in my mind. Um, I think it, it means either seven or 3,500. I suppose if you can look and tell your opponent's just check folding, then you want to check it back because they're dead. But very rarely will you know that. I think I'd probably do seven. I, I, I Actually, in reality, this is another spot where I'd probably just go smaller, like five, if I'm playing here. Like, I'd go for a medium size. Poker coaching steady grip says you would blast it because a king is not folding. I'm not thinking they have a whole lot of kings here. I'm thinking they have a lot of sevens here. I'm sorry, sevens. I mean, I think they have a lot of tens or nines here. I'm looking at seven thousand bet. I'm thinking I have a lot of tens and nines in the spot or junky draws. It's a tough spot, right? Where again, if you like really know how this player plays, which you won't, but if you do really know how this player plays, you probably want to go very like use a very exploitative size. And like, if you think I have a lot of hands like ace jack and ace queen, you want to bet thirty five hundred. Or if you think I have a lot of nines or like pocket sixes, you want to go thirty five hundred, right? If you think they have a lot of uh, tens, though, I think seven's fine. Let's do seven. So we still have the best hand by a mile. And at this point, we can easily get called by a king, which you know may or may not check. Kings often bet. Or a 10 or a 9, right? 10 or 9 will definitely check. If, if our opponent did lead a hand like queen 10 or ace 10, he's definitely going to check call turn if we don't bet too big. So this is a spot where I think the play is to go for a small size. Also, the nice thing about a small size of 3,500 is that we give the opponent every possible opportunity to do something dumb. Like, if they do have ace-jack, they may decide to check shove all in, where if we bet small, whereas if we bet big, like 10,500, they're just never going to bluff us. Notice that's like half our stack, right? So in this scenario, something I like to do is always do my best to give the illusion of fold equity when I have the nuts or an effective nut hand. So this is a spot where I think I like a small bet of about 3,500. I also don't hate 10,000, but I think 10,000 starts to like really put pressure on the opponent, and I would hate for my opponent to fold out a hand like a 9 or a 10 at this point. And I do think that will happen sometimes if you start going bigger, like 7,000. In reality, the right size is probably something like 5,000. Um, 3,500 probably leaves a little bit of money on the table. Like I said, 5,000 is probably ideal. What do we do? What about when he has king 10? What do you mean, what about it? You lose. Sometimes he gets stacked. You got to realize we're playing 30 big blind poker here. And whenever you make a straight against a full house, 30 big blinds deep, you're losing your money. Should the opponent check if they have king 10? Uh, yeah, probably. If they're good. I think um, if they do have king 10, they should definitely check it on the turn because that's a hand that definitely wants to keep me in with all of my nonsense. 
Clearly, they should check her bet small, but almost certainly, um, almost certainly check turn if they're any anywhere near decent. But we have a recreational player who's already leaning on a board that's really, really bad to lead, so they're probably not decent. Um, but yeah, you got to realize sometimes you lose. The goal in poker is not to avoid every possible setup because when you avoid every possible setup, you don't get value out of your value hands. You win poker tournaments by getting a hold of a lot of chips and then taking advantage of the spots where the big stack has a gigantic advantage, mainly all the bubbles that happen. You do not win poker tournaments by hanging around and blinding out and trying to avoid setups. So no, we're betting here. And if he raises me, I'm putting my 17,400 in. Happily. Happily. By the way, raising here with a full house would be awful because they're not vulnerable to get outdrawn at all. And they want to really, really, really let me improve to like a flush or a straight or let me make some bad value bet on the river. Raising would be terrible for the opponent if they have a full house. So I think their only option full house is to either check or bet small. And if they do check, they should just check call. But this time... Ooh, here we go! The here opponent we go! Check, raises, small. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Should we <laughs> fold? Should we call? Or should we go all in? Well, we're not folding, I can tell you that. I just told you that. Could you imagine if I folded here? This would be the most absurd fold I've ever seen. Why would this be a bad fold? This would be a bad fold because it could easily be overvaluing a king. When I say overvaluing, that's not necessarily overvaluing, but it would be... I mean, it's at least somewhat reasonable. He has you beat here, LOL. I mean, he could. I don't know. The problem is, again, pot odds. Look at how giant the pot is. Also, do we beat any value hands the opponent may play in this way? Would the opponent ever play a vulnerable king this way? Like king four suited, like I said they could easily have on the flop. I mean, I think so. A lot of people are scared of getting outdrawn with the king four suited. Would they ever make some ridiculous play with like ace jack of diamonds? Sure, right? So the question then becomes call or shove. Notice we only have um, 11,000 behind, so we would be putting in 10,000 more. If they have um, if they have a king, they're just going to call it off because they're getting pretty good odds draw to a boat. If they have a, full, a flush draw, I don't really care if they fold. So I think this is pretty easy all in. The only time I'd want to call is if I'm just really sure this guy's range is a bunch of nonsense, but I highly doubt this range is a bunch of nonsense. I expect this to either be a pretty good main hand, mainly a king or better, or a draw. So it's like an easy all in to me. It's always unnerving when your opponent has a stack that could realistically shove you all in and then they check raise small instead. Uh, usually this is a sign of a very strong hand. So what is a strong hand on king, 10, nine, king? That makes logical sense. You got to think the full houses don't really need the check raise because I'm drawing dead against the full house with my entire range, right? So they really want to keep me in in that case. That's an important point. That's an important point. I realize a lot of people just check raise with their king 10 because they think they want to get all the money in. But I'm telling you, it would be really bad. Really bad. And, and look, you can make some plays making the assumption your opponent's like kind of bad. But most people in $5,000 buy-in tournaments are not really bad. Okay? Most people are just not really bad. Most people in most games are not really bad. Some are, but most are not. So this is a spot where I think you can kind of discount the hands like full houses because those would check call. So given they would probably not check raise the full houses, that makes this a strong hand, but a lesser hand. So what is a strong but lesser hand in this spot? Well, that's going to be a whole lot of king X and a whole lot of straights, which I don't care about, right? So I beat the king X and I chop with the straights. So this is a spot where I think we have a pretty easy all in. You may say, well, if your opponent's a recreational player, they, they could just not know any better and check raise a hand like pocket nines or king nine because they're afraid of not getting full value. And sure... That could be true. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked if the player showed up with the uh, full house here. What happens to a lot of people is they elect to not go all in here. They just call or fold, and then they figure out a way to fold on the river, or they pay them off anyway, and then they happen to be beat. Or they shove, and they happen to be beat. And they're like, oh, the shoving was terrible, because they're only doing that with the nuts. And I do agree, the opponent's probably only doing this with pretty strong hands, but I think in this scenario, we are in fine shape against that strong hand range. Also, every once in a while, the opponent's going to be doing this with a weird draw. Um, and the thing is, like, even a hand like well, any flush draw or ace jack, I don't really care if those fold for an extra, you know, 9,000 chips or whatever it'll be. So I think we have a pretty easy all-in. Also, if we do call and the opponent does happen to have, like, king three, um, if the river is a bad card, like jack of diamonds, ten of, queen of diamonds, etc., the opponent will then 
um, perhaps even check fold, even for the, the, the last 10,000. So this is a spot where I think we have a pretty easy all in, knowing we're getting called by every hand that beats us, but at the same time getting called by a lot of King X as well. Opponent does call. They do have the King X. This was a very poorly played hand by the opponent. Um, <laughs> opponent should have checked the flop for sure. Check flop, if I bet and this player um, calls, the King 8 can actually fold. And if um, this player checks, I bet this player folds. And this King 8 has a call, check call flop. Probably it's check call turn, check call river because in this spot I have a lot of nut hands. So very poorly played by the opponent and it works out great for me. Notice here in this spot, I probably would have found a way to get all in by the river, but by check call, check call, check call, they would have given me every opportunity to bluff. As they played it, they kind of forced me to have a pretty good hand, right? And whenever you have a strong but non-nut hand like this, you don't want to force your opponent to fold all their garbage, right? And if they instead check, I'll bluff with a lot of stuff in this spot on the flop, and then keep betting the turn and sometimes jam the river, because I realize I have ace, king, king, queen, king, jack in my range. And this player blocks all that. So that would have been a much, much, much better way because it would have kept this guy with all of his bluffs. Let's go through one more hand and we'll call it a day. Hope you're all having fun. If you're having a good time, click like, click subscribe. Are these quizzes on poker coaching? Yes. You can just filter by Jonathan Little. I think these are some of the first ones that came up. This is from a $5,000 tournament I played a few years ago. And I wanted to see if I uh, still played anywhere like I played today. And we found a few spots where maybe I make different, slightly different plays. Here we have 9-7 suited in the small blind. It's pretty nice. Facing a loose, aggressive raise from the cutoff and a splashy call from the button. Should we fold, call, re-raise to 6,200 or re-raise to 8,800? Mm -hmm -hmm. So when you're playing multi-way with a shallow stack opener, you pretty much only want to be re-raising with pretty high equity hands. And you definitely don't want to be re-raising with stuff like 9-7 suited because it flops really well. If we were playing very deep stacked, I think re-raising becomes way more reasonable. But even then, I think 9-7 suited is a fine hand to call and see the flop. Don't fold. This seems like a pretty easy spot to call to me. Um, if we were all playing about 18,000 deep or 20,000 deep, going all in could be reasonable if you think this player is opening way too wide. I discussed this way back in my first poker book about how if you have a lot of fold equity, you can shove very wide, and some hands that do reasonably when get called are suited connectors. So these are pretty good hands to shove, and they're going to play kind of poorly out of position. So if we were all 20,000 deep, we could go all in. That said, we're not all 20,000 deep. We're all, well, everybody else is pretty deep, so shoving is out of the question. So should we fold? Eh, not really. This hand flops well enough, and we're getting pretty good odds, and the big blind's probably not going to re-raise all that often. Should we re-raise? Um, no, because if we make it 6,200, we're going to be giving both players very good odds to call, right? And given they're both loose and splashy, they're probably both going to call. And then we have nine high out of position, which is not good. If we make it 8,800, we'll get more fold equity preflop. But then if the cutoff does decide to go all in for 20,000 total, which they you know will do with any decently strong hand, then we have to put in 12 to win 40. So we have to call it off with the 9-7 suited, which is also not really what we want. So in this scenario, really the only option is to call. See, some people are saying 60 something big blinds deep is too shallow to call from the small blind. Let's take a look at, uh, just take a look at a uh, cutoff. This is for a heads up pot, multi-way. It's, I think it's even better to call. We are in the small blind versus raise from cutoff. You're gonna see. 9-7 suited calls 100% of the time, 60 big blinds deep. So I don't know what you're talking about. It's too tight, too, too, too bad to fold, or too bad to call 60 big blinds deep. Let's take a look at 20 big blinds deep. This is obviously not the spot we're in, but you're going to see even then, like, it's close, right? Like, 9-8 suited is a call. And in this scenario, uh, we are not going to get jammed on pretty much ever by the big blind because this player's kind of shallow. Or we're, sorry, we're deep, right? So this is a spot where I think we should call slightly wider than this chart and really pr pretty much like like this chart with our calling range i think that's pretty pretty nice like i said if i was deeper i would consider three betting it as you see these hands in this vicinity do three bet deeper if we're heads up but again multi-way you can call just a little bit wider and and you three bet bluff these hands a little bit less often when you get multi-way three bet for value with these hands a little bit more often so anyway this is a very 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 standard spot to call it i mean the idea that i'm calling only to try to get implied odds is not correct Sometimes we get bluffs through, et cetera, et cetera. We're not calling only to try to make the nuts.
folding in the spot from the small blind in a tournament facing a minimum raise would be, in my mind, pretty bad. See the flop three ways, and we flop. And, and to be fair, uh, you got to realize that when I say pretty bad, I don't mean like it's some gigantic punt. But what I mean is it's a play that will cost you a small bit of equity. And if you make a small bit of equity over and over, or a small bit of equity mistake over and over and over again, you're going to have a hard time winning because I mean, these are just spots where you're bleeding off equity. And also, these are spots where you either lose a little or win a ton. And those are exactly the spots you want to be in, right? Because that's how you're going to end up getting a whole lot of chips. So definitely, definitely, definitely see the flop. Flop the trips. Ooh, that's lucky. Should we check? Bet 2,200. Hmm. Bet 4,400. Or bet 6,600 interesting spot if we were in the big blind i'd be way more inclined to lead than if i'm in the small blind because small blind really shouldn't have a ton of sevens let me look at the chart right look at the sevens we have we have king seven suited which i probably would have called ten seven suited i probably would have called nine seven eight seven seven six i would have called all these so we have those but notice it's not all that many combinations of hands let's look at the button range button range versus raise from cutoff you see they have a similar range although again they're 20 big blinds they're kind of 20 big blinds deep. they're not really 20 big blinds deep but they're kind of 20 big blinds deep because they do have some sevens as well they'll probably call a touch like what eight seven suited every time seven six suited every time so anyway i think in this spot leading has some merit but i would just check so there are certainly times to consider leading when you flop a very strong hand but i do not think this is one of them i'm um, I actually give leading some points here. I guess I'll see. We'll see why. I also give checking the best score. So interesting spot. From the small blind, we should not have a whole lot of nut hands here. Um, yeah, we have like maybe ten seven suited, nine seven suited, eight seven suited, seven six suited. We probably don't want to be leading eight seven suited because this is super nuts. We have pocket eights as well. We don't want to lead that either. Um, so there really aren't a ton of hands we want to lead. Also, this is a spot where the cutoff and the button both have a lot of sevens in their ranges. I mean, roughly the same number as me, right? So it's not like I have all the sevens and they have none. Whereas uh, it would be a little bit different if I called from the big blind, because then I'd have, you know, seven, six offsuit, whereas from the small blind, I don't have seven, six offsuit. Or if we were against an under the gun raiser who should not have very many sevens, then this is a spot where we could at least consider leading because we have the range or we have the nut advantage, right? Uh, this In this spot, though, I think it makes no sense to lead because it's very easy for these players to bet frequently, given they're both loose and splashy. And, um, you know, we're, we're kind of shallow stacked already to the point that I don't really care about building the pot. And I, I don't really have to fear going check, check, check a lot of the time. This would be very different if we were against like a weak, straightforward, under the gun player. And that scenario, maybe it does make some sense to lead, but not here. I think checking is the only play that makes sense. If we are going to lead, we want to lead medium, like 4,400. If we lead for 2,200, whatever the opponents have is going to be getting really good odds to call. And if we lead bigger, like 6,600, then the cutoff, the loose splashy player just knows, or probably knows, I'm not going to fold all that often if they shove. You always want to give the illusion of fold equity in spots like this when you have a very, very nut hand. So if I am going to lead, it's going to be for about 4,400, but I'm not leading here, mainly because we're in the small blind against two ranges that should have a lot of sevens, even though I know that they um, probably don't have it this time. No, sir, I do give leading at least some points. I do think leading is reasonable. I think it's reasonable because I do have some bluffs that would like to lead here some portion of the time, like backdoor flush draws. Like, I mean, imagine I have like queen jack of diamonds. I don't hate leading. I think that's actually pretty nice. Um... I saw a comment I want to say. Luan says, you don't like a check because there will be a lot of check backs in this spot. While that's true, you also want to ask, are there a lot of bluffing hands? There really aren't, right? Queen, Jack, and Diamonds, right? That's about it. I don't really want to lead like Jack, 10 of Diamonds because you have to fold it to a raise. You want to lead hands that are happy enough folding to a raise and you want to lead nuts. That is vulnerable to being outdrawn. And I think this hand's like, a re it's a reasonable candidate to lead because it is very vulnerable to being outdrawn in the spot notice the opponent's ranges all contain straight draws all contain flush draws so i think it's reasonable um i, I do agree that you're not going to face a bet all that often in these spots which is a bummer but like whatever you can just bet turn to jam river right or bet big on the river anyway loose splashy cut off bets button folds mm. should we call Raise to 6,500, raise to 9,500, or go all in. Definitely a spot where you can make a very exploitative play in live poker. If you can look and tell they like their hand, rip it in. If you can look and tell they don't like their hand, call. I don't hate a minimum raise. 
I got to think this is one of these spots. Let me consult my brain real quick. Yeah, I got to think this is one of these spots where we're supposed to check min rays a lot with our hearts that we're going to call a shove with, our sevens that we're going to call a shove with, our best eights that we're going to call a shove with, and some junk. Like king, king, X of diamonds, king, king X of diamonds, king nine of diamonds, stuff like that. So I think min rays is actually probably pretty good from a GTO point of view. I don't know if I was aware of this back then. Because um, like I said, this is tournaments from a few years ago. So I, I actually like min raising a lot from a GTO point of view. Now the question is, is exploitatively, is that the right thing to do? If you can look and tell the opponent doesn't like their hand, do not raise, right? Just call. If you can look and tell they love their hand, maybe it makes sense to shove. If you know nothing though, I usually just err towards GTO play. Let's see if that's the right thing. Uh, this is a spot where we have a few viable options. Uh, calling is definitely fine if you think the loose, splashy cutoffs range is very, very weak. If it is very, very weak, then we want to call because we want to keep them in because they're drawing thin or dead, right? Like, if you know this player is going to raise all sorts of nonsense and then bet all sorts of nonsense into two players on the flop, then, you know, definitely call because they're going to have, you know, ace high and king queen and stuff like that. If you think they're going to be a little bit more reasonable where they're raising a regular range and they're going to only bet with their pretty good made hands and draws, in that case, you should be way more inclined to raise because if they have a draw, you don't really care if they fold or put more money in the pot. And if they have a pretty good made hand like an overpair or an eight, then you also want to just get money in the pot because they're not going to fold. This is a spot where if you look at the GTO strategy, it is often to min raise. Um, you, you typically want to min raise in when you're out of position, shallow stacked in spots like this on paired boards where you have a lot of nut hands. And you want to be min raising with your premium hands, like all the sevens. Even some hands like an eight is it may be good enough to get it in. It's a little bit convoluted because it's a multi-way spot, so maybe that makes the cutoffs range tighter than if it was a um, heads-up pot, right? Because they're not going to bet everything in this on this flop. Whereas if they are, if we're heads-up, they may bet with a wider flop range, so an eight is better, right? Um, but we definitely want to raise with our sevens, small, and we also want to raise with our premium draws that are going to call off against the shove. That's going to be like ace high flush draws, ten nine of hearts, jack nine of hearts, stuff like that. It's like really good draws, and then we want to raise with some junky draws too. What are some junky draws here? Stuff like mm, random diamonds, ace-x of diamonds. I think that could be reasonable. Um, we could check raise with stuff like 5-4 suited if we have it. 6-4 suited if we have it. Um, we probably don't want to check min raise 6-5 and 10-9 because those, if they get shoved on, are kind of getting roughly a break-even price to call. So we'd rather call with those, I think. Um, that said, I could certainly be convinced check raise 10-9 and don't fold it. Um, we also may want to check raise just random garbage, <laughs> like queen jack of clubs every once in a while. Queen jack of diamonds, I think, is definitely fine to check raise too. You have to be a little bit careful check raising like jack 10 of diamonds, jack 10 in general, because jack 10 actually has pretty good equity when you get shoved on, because the opponent's going to have some draws in their range as well. So it's you got to realize we have to put in, if we check min raise, we have to put in, well, I'll show you that I go, do go ahead and check min raise here. Um, we would then have to put in, what, 12 more to try to win 40. So are we good, you know, 30-ish percent of the time? I mean, Jack 10 is actually probably good about that often. Essentially, you don't want to be check raising hands that are getting roughly the break-even price to call. You either want to check raise hands that are really good, like our seven, or hands that have very good equity, like 10 nine of hearts, or hands that have an easy fold. And in this spot, if you think about my preflop range, there really aren't a ton of those that have good equity that would have to fold. Um, so you probably want to use all of them, right? Uh, if we were in the big blind, notice I would have hands like 10-7 offsuit and 5-4 offsuit, right? So we'd have a much wider range of like clear hands that can check min raise and then fold to a shove. But not in this spot. So anyway, I do go for the check min raise. Uh, you you may okay, I want to talk about some comments here. All the draws make you... Well, with all the, all the, the fact that there are a lot of draws make you want to put him all in. That is not a good thought process from a GTO point of view for the most part. In this scenario, you want to ask, how do I play as many hands as possible in a profitable manner? Right? So what if we did have a hand like ace three of diamonds? Well, it's just a fold. If your only options are fold or shove, you don't really want to shove it because we get called or close to dead. So we should probably fold it, right? You gotta realize, we can call and we can min raise. We are playing no limit hold'em. It's not only all in or fold hold'em. And a very common spot that comes up when you're playing 20 to 30 big blinds deep are scenarios like this where you have a lot of draws that would like to raise, but 
also a lot of draws that just don't have quite the right price to call and have some equity. So the way you go about playing all these profitably is by check min raising your entire range. I'm not going to be checking much of anything in the spot. Because if you check min raise the nut draws, you can easily call. If you check raise the nut hands like this in seven, you easily call. And if you check raise the garbage draws and get shoved, you can easily fold. And this is a spot a lot of people screw up because they either shove or fold everything and they don't use all of their options. This is a very, very, very common spot that you will know if you have studied GTO strategies 20 to 30 big blinds deep. The out-of-position players in these spots get to check min rays a lot. Okay? Andrew, good morning, says click the like button. Definitely click the like button. I would appreciate it. Rip it all in. Yeah, again, the problem with ripping it all in with my range is that I don't get to play all of the junkie bluffs prof profitably. It's very, very, very important to ask yourself, how do I play as wide of a range in the most profitable manner? I mean, people screw this up all the time when they look at a shove fold charts preflop when they're playing 20 big blinds deep. They'll tell you which hands you can shove and which hands you should fold, but don't forget you're allowed to min raise. There are other options, right? Um, some, some people a while back decided to charge people for an app that would show them reshove charts where if somebody raises, then the only option is to shove or fold. But you're allowed to call. I mean, beautiful example. Let me show you. Let's take a look at 20 big blind, button strategy versus raise from the cutoff. A lot of people shove or fold in this spot only. They have no calls. But look at this. You're supposed to call 40% of the time that you get to play your hand, right? Eight divided by 20 is 40%. So you get to call, you should call from a GTO point of view about 40% of the time. And if you don't play all these hands on the bottom of this range, because they're not good enough to shove, and these hands aren't quite good enough to shove, you end up playing way fewer hands profitably. So you have to realize that your options are not limited to only a very, very, very few, okay? You're gonna find that from a game theory optimal point of view, you wanna use a lot of options. And when you simplify that too much, you start losing a lot of equity. Now here, I'm sure GTO strategy, perfect GTO strategy, would use, would use all sorts of race sizes. But if you use one minimum race size, one all in size and a call size, a call and a fold, uh, that's going to be fine. So anyway, this is a spot where check and raise with hands like this is pretty much always the right play. You may want to check shove all in sometimes if you can just look and tell this player has a very good hand. Um, like if you just know their range is very strong or if you can look and tell they have the nuts, then you just want to check shove and just get them to call all in immediately. Pally says if you check min raise and get called here and a heart comes, you should fold. No, 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 no. I don't know if that's what Pally's saying, but I'm going to extrapolate. You are not folding this hand. I want to make that crystal clear. This is another spot where we're playing shallow stacked. You make the trips, you're putting your money in, okay? Uh, you don't really want to check raise like 9,500 because when you check raise to 9,500, now this player knows they have no fold equity. Whereas here, they may at least think they have some. Anyway, they should have all in. Should we fold or should we call? Call. This is a trivially easy call. We have the nuts. Uh, like I said, I, when we structure our range intelligently here, we're going to be very polarized to either premium made hands, like a seven, or any any made hand we're check raising, like even if we check raise nine, eight, we're calling it off here. So we're calling it off with all of our made hands. We're calling it off. Worth noting, if you have an eight here and you check raise, you call. We have no chips. Well, the opponent has no chips. Off with all of our premium draws that have good equity, and we're folding all of our junky draws that have bad equity. Easy. Opponent has queens, you know, I, I don't hate their play. It's a pretty, pretty nasty spot. In this scenario, when they do shove, they get it all in ahead against draws and they get it all in ahead against some eights if I have them and they make me fold out equity with the, the random gut shots and whatnot. So tough spot for the opponent and I think they are just going broke here. Yeah, I mean, tough spot for the opponent, like I said, nothing they can do. If you check raise and a heart comes, you can reassess. There's nothing to reassess, you have the nuts. When you have the nuts, you're not trying to fold everyone. If you check the turn and your opponent jams on a heart, you say call happily, happily. You are not trying to make big folds. Making big folds over and over and over and over and over again will result in you not winning poker tournaments. It's a great way to get some min caches, but um, there's been a decent amount of studies out there that the people who min cash the most are often the biggest losers in poker because in exchange for min caching a lot, they almost never win. It's important to win and you win by getting chips. Sometimes you lose and that is okay. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed today's show. If you did, do me a favor. Click the like and subscribe buttons down below. Click the notification bell. Click all the buttons. The buttons make the internet know that you like this. I'd appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'm going to be recording a lot of YouTube videos today for all of you. So that's a lot of fun. 
been away for, um, call it spring break or whatever it is, with the kids for the last week. I've not done much work at all. Feels kind of weird. And now I have about 600 emails to go through and about 20 YouTube videos to record. And a gigantic course for PokerCoaching.com. I will not spoil it. But that's coming out very soon as well. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunity. When you say you saw a discount offer for poker coaching and now you can't find it. Well, you messed up, didn't you? Make sure you, if you're on our email list, you will probably have gotten that. You have to sign up for a free poker coaching account to get on our email, on our email list. Go to pokercoaching.com slash free. Or if you know what you saw, send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com and tell them I sent you and we'll give you the discount. Good luck. Have fun. Make the most of your opportunities. I hope you have a great, 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 great week. I'll talk to all of you later. Bye-bye.